If we track and optimize biomarkers of organ and systemic health, can aging be slowed? Now, most health and anti-aging approaches only focus on metabolic markers, including glucose and the lipid panel. In contrast, big picture biomarkers that I commonly show on this channel include the metabolic markers, but also include markers of immune, liver, kidney function, and others. As shown here, so the immune uh, category would include white blood cells or leukocytes, erythrocytes, red blood cells, thrombocytes, platelets, C-reactive protein. Each of those are included in the big picture biomarkers. Also included are markers related to liver health and function, including the transferase enzymes, uh, more specifically AST, albumin, and not included on, the, on this list for this paper uh, is alkaline phosphatase, which is in the big, uh, big picture biomarker list. And I also include markers related to kidney function, including creatinine, blood urea nitrogen, and uric acid. Now, leanness and fitness is a big part of my approach, which would cover the muscul most of the musculoskeletal category. And in terms of cardiovascular markers, I commonly, or I measure every day, resting heart rate and heart rate variability, RHR and HRV. So the goal if, uh, is to cover as many systems as possible. And the hypothesis is that by tracking and attempting to optimize as many systems as possible, we may be able to delay aging and potentially extend lifespan. So what about markers related to lung function, blood pressure, BP, and brain? Interestingly, there, it may be possible to improve lung function, which will reduce blood pressure, and that be, may be a means to slow brain aging. So let's get into it. So first, lung function, at, uh, defined as the FEV1, declines during aging. So the first question then is, what is the forced expiratory volume in one second, or FEV1? And that's how much air can be forcefully expired in one second and it declines during age, aging as shown here. So we're looking at the FEV1 on the y-axis plotted against age. And in this case, we've got people younger than 20 and older than up to older than 80. So we can see that the FEV1 peaks uh, around 20 years old and then steadily declines during aging. This is data in men. I covered the data for women in an earlier video. If you missed that, it'll be in the right corner. So FEV1 is also a top predictor of chronological age. In this preprint, and note that all of the papers in this video will be in the video's description. So if you're interested in that, check it out. So in this study, and this was a study that included about 400,000 people, including both men and women, as shown by the black arrows, we can see that uh, well, actually first by looking at the biomark biomarker contribution to the chronicle age prediction, in other words, how much did each biomarker contribute to the overall prediction of chronological age. In men, we can see that the FEV1 was the third best predictor. And in women, it was the second best. And note that in men, the FEV1 was a better predictor or contributed more to the prediction of chronological age relative to other blood-based biomarkers, including markers of kidney function, so cystatin C and urea, and other bio blood-based blood biomarkers, including testosterone and IGF-1. Now, before leaving this data, note that the best predictor or the predictor that contributed most to uh, the prediction of chronological age is systolic blood pressure. And I'll have more on that in a minute. So to improve FEV1 or and or slow the age-related decline, tracking is the first step. And FEV1 is measured with a spirometer, and I've highlighted this one uh, because it's been shown to uh, be as good as spir spirometry uh, performed at the physician's office. Uh, so I, I was interested in getting a spirometer uh, that could measure FEV1 that's been uh, peer-reviewed to, you know, to be as good or similar to what's performed in a doctor's office. And this model here has been shown uh, indeed to do that. So then the big question then is, what's my FEV1? So I've only been tracking it for about the past month. I only have nine days of data. So each of these red circles is an individual day of data. So we've got the FEV1 there on the y-axis plotted against each data point for, uh, for about the last month. And note that each data point also represents the highest value of nine attempts per day. I didn't want to just measure this once because there, there could be potential variability in each measurement. So by measuring it nine times and taking the highest value, I should be able to minimize uh, the test-to-test -test variability uh, by using the spirometer. So when we take the average of these nine measurements over about the past uh, three weeks, uh, three weeks to month, we can see that my average FEV1 is 3.27 liters per second. So how does that compare with the expected FEV1 based on chronological age? So for that, we go back to the plot on the left, and we can see that my expected FEV1 based on my chronological age would be 3.7 liters per second. However, my data is to the right of that, which would be 11 to 12 years older uh, than expected based on chronological age, so not good. If there's a weakness in my data, this is 
potentially also a weak, weakness in my data in addition to DHEA sulfate at the moment. And note that it's far from youthful values, which would be somewhere around 4.5 liters per second. So now note that I don't know what my FEV1 was in youth, so I can't say if or and how much it's declined. And then the next question is, can it be improved? I don't like having data that's older than expected based on my chronological age, so I obviously want to make it better. Can it be improved? And the good news is it can. So this is a study uh, looking at ins ins inspiratory muscle training, or IMT, in long distance runners. And there are many studies using IMT, or insp again, inspiratory muscle training, uh, in uh, unhealthy populations, for example, people that have lung disease, so COPT, uh, COPD as an, as an example, but I wanted to focus on relatively healthy populations because that will be mo most relevant to me uh, uh, for now. So what is the IMT? And in this case, this isn't just deep breathing against no resistance. This is deep breathing uh, against a resistance. And you can see uh, it, a device is used for that that provides the resistance uh, either on inhalation or exhalation. So again, on inhalation would be an IMT trainer. Uh, EMT would be uh, a trainer focused on exhalation muscle, muscle training. So this is pulmonary system strength training. So in this study, the average age and BMI is shown there. So this is a relatively young cohort, uh, average age about 24 years and relatively lean with a normal uh, BMI of 22 kilograms per meter squared. This was an eight week study. They trained five days a week and they did 30 inspirations. Each, each group did 30 inspirations per day. And then there were three groups. So in the, uh, and note that each of these three groups that uh, one of the things they were looking at in terms of lung function was uh, FEV1, obviously to see if uh, it improved as a result of training. So in the first group, they used a device called Power Breathe, and uh, they, they, again, this wasn't just deep breathing. They trained against a resistance. In this case, the resistance was 50 to 70 percent of their maximal inspiratory pressure, or MIP. And we can see for this group, there was a significant increase of 7.7 percent for the FEV1 after the eight, uh, at the end of the eight-week study. In the second group, they used a, also an IMT, an inspiratory muscle training device known as Threshold. Uh, ideally, they should have used the same uh, device, Power Breathe, but they used a different one. And they also used a different MIP, a different uh, maximal inspiratory uh, pressure of 30 to 50%. And in this group, there was no change when compared with baseline for the FEV1. So from these two groups, we can see that it's possible that IMT training at greater than 50% of the maximal inspiratory pressure may be required for uh, improving FEV1. And in the last group, these were the controls. There was no inspiratory muscle training, no IMT. And we can see that they didn't change from baseline. Uh, and after, when compared with baseline, the eight week data wasn't different from baseline. So note that FEV1 is a measure of expiratory muscle strength as you're, uh, you're quantifying the amount that you're able to expire, the amount of air that you're able to expire in one second. So why have I studied, why have I decided to focus on a study that used inspiratory uh, muscle strength training? So note that there's a lot less data, published data for expiratory muscle training when compared with IMT. And also, inspiratory muscle training has been also shown to reduce blood pressure. And we can see that data here. So we've got the SBP, systolic blood pressure on the y-axis, and then we've, we've got that plotted against age. So two studies in young adults, one study in middle-aged uh, slash older adults, and then two studies in middle-aged slash older adults that had obstructive sleep apnea. So for all six of these studies, uh, and before getting into the data, note that the two circles, black is baseline and the tan is post-inspiratory muscle strength training or IMST. So for each of these six studies, we can see that blood pressure, systolic blood pressure was significantly reduced, regardless if the starting blood pressure was relatively high or low. So you can see that for the young group, blood pressure, uh, systolic blood pressure was in the 110 to 120 range, which is relatively low, and they saw improvements. And then there were also uh, blood pressure improvements even for people who had uh, values in the range of the 130 to 140 range, so higher. So, so blood pressure was improved regardless if the starting blood pressure was relatively high or low, and regardless if uh, the groups were young or relatively older. So from this, we can see that inspiratory muscle strength training, IMST, improved lung function as defined in this case as one measure of lung function, the FEV1, which also serves to reduce systolic blood pressure. So how does that link with slowed brain aging? So in this study, Optimal Blood Pressure Keeps Our Brains Younger, they identified a relatively younger brain age, which was assessed by MRI, in people that had blood pressure values that were less than 115 over 75. 
So then the question becomes, could my blood pressure benefit from uh, inspiratory or expiratory or combination of the two training? So for that, let's take a look at my blood pressure values over the last three years. Now, compared to other data like uh, resting heart rate, heart rate variability, where I have 1,500 days of data, uh, I haven't tracked blood pressure as frequently. As you can see, I only have 55 data points over a three-year period. Nonetheless, when taking the average of these 55 days, my average systolic blood pressure is 123.2 milligrams of mercury. So based on the brain age study that I just showed before, with uh, um, re a reduced brain age for people that had uh, uh, 115 over 75, I've got some room for improvement with my 123 value. So what's my expected, to further illustrate this point, what's my expected systolic blood pressure based on chronological age? And we can see that here, systolic blood pressure, and this is over the about 20 to 95 year old age range. So my expected uh, systolic blood pressure based on chronological age would be 125 millimeters of mercury. So we can see that I'm relatively close to what's expected from my chronological age, and this is not youthful data, which would be somewhere going in the other direction, going to the left, somewhere closer to 115. So I've got room for improvement with my systolic blood pressure. All right, what about diastolic blood pressure? So over those same 55 data points over the past three years, my average DBP is about 75 millimeters of mercury. And we can see that that's good based on the brain age study as less than 75 for the diastolic blood pressure was associated with the younger, or relatively younger brain age. So then the big question is how will I reduce systolic blood pressure? And as we saw earlier in the video, inspiratory muscle training, IMST, improved lung function and more specifically the FEV1, and IMST training has also been shown to reduce blood pressure and more specifically systolic blood pressure. Now, with, with this in mind, I think it's possible to improve two organ systems and maybe even three brain age, uh, although I won't be able to do MRI on my brain, so I won't be able to know for sure, uh, but at least theoretically, I should be able to improve brain age if systolic blood pressure has an impact on brain age by just using one technique, so inspiratory muscle strength training. But then I think the biggest bang, bang for the buck will be by using a combined inspiratory and expiratory muscle trainer. I don't think it makes sense to only train one group of muscles uh, that are related to lung function. I think it makes the most sense to train the inspiratory and the expiratory muscles. So my next step is to buy a combined device and I'm still sorting out which one is best, but I should have a decision relatively soon. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. And before you go, we've got a whole bunch of discount links that you may be interested in, including oral microbiome, uh, oral microbiome composition, epigenetic testing, at-home testing, uh, blood testing with Quantify, diet tracking with Chronometer, or if you're interested in just supporting the channel, you can do that with the website, Buy Me A Coffee, and each of these links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.